Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Welcome back to another edition of Top Traders Roundtable, a podcast series on managed futures. My name is Niels Castro Blasen, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's conversation with industry leaders and pioneers in managed futures brought to you by CME Group. Today, I'm joined by Jennifer Suno, who is the Director of Compliance at the NFA, Arthur Bell, CPA and Managing Member of Bell Tower LLC, and J.P. Bruins, who is a partner at the law firm Akin Gump. First of all, welcome and thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to join me for our conversation regarding some of the things that goes on behind the scenes of the managed futures industry. I'm very excited about our session today, not least because you really are the A-team in this industry, so our listeners are in for a real treat. Now, Before we jump into today's topic, share with me a short version of your own background and how you got to where you are today. And maybe, Jennifer, why don't we start with you? Tell us about your journey and how that led you to the NFA and perhaps what has kept you there for quite a while. Sure. So I've been at NFA since 1994, so I've pretty much spent my entire career here. I started in futures because I had taken some classes in college and was very interested in futures and went to school in Chicago, so was well aware of the exchanges here and their impact on uh, the futures industry and just was really excited about coming here. And, uh, you know, the thing I think that I like about NFA is that we do try and, and be very receptive to people in the industry and put together rules and, and interpretive notices and things and, and guidance that give our members the tools they need to be able to um, effectively manage their firms. And I think that we do serve a good uh, service to the industry in general in terms of keeping the fraud at bay and uh, and protecting customers. So that's what's kept me there for so long. Yeah. And ha- what's sort of your journey inside the NFA? Has it been more or less doing the same area of expertise or has that changed over the years? Uh, I've primarily been in compliance, but also spent some time in market regulation and um, actually headed up our New York office for a few years and then came back to Chicago to be a director of compliance here. So I've been a little bit all over the place, but um, <laughs> mainly in compliance. Sure, sure. And and just my last question, just for the benefit of our listeners, when did the NFA actually get founded? When? How long does it date back? So we are celebrating our 35th anniversary this month. So wow. it's been around since 1983. And has Fantastic. changed and grown a lot over the years, but uh, the, the basic mission has always stayed the same. Wonderful. Great stuff. Now, how about you, Art? I mean, to me, you're kind of an icon in this industry, and I don't think I've ever attended a conference in the last 27 years or so without getting something to bring home that had the name Arthur Bell on it. And deservedly so, you were given a a Lifetime Achievement Award at the CTA Forum earlier this year, so congratulations on this recognition of your contribution to our industry, but please share with us sort of some of your long journey and, and, and how that's taken you. Well, Niels, thank you very much, and we're looking forward to you returning all the things that you took from us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've been in this industry since uh, about 1974, so I was involved in the commodity and futures business prior to the formation of the CFTC and the NFA. Up until about the year 2000, uh, all of my clients were CTAs, CPOs, everybody involved in the managed futures industry. Around 2000, we did expand to pick up uh, hedge funds as well. But our practice today is exclusively in alternative investments, including, of course, managed futures. We have offices 
in our main office is in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Then we have offices in New York City, in Ireland, and in the Cayman Islands. So my, my experience has been in pretty much every aspect of managed futures, auditing, tax return preparation, compliance, regulatory matters. I've been on various committees with the CFTC, worked with the NFA. I was an arbitrator for the NFA for a number of years, but I had so many clients, I was often conflicted out of the arbitration. <laughs> <laughs> so one side or the other or the lawyer or, or parties involved. It was kind of interesting. Uh, so that's my background uh, in, in this industry for, for many, many years. Sure. Fantastic. Excellent. Now, what about you, JP? I know that you also have a long career, but this time on the legal side of the alternative investment space, and you've been recognized by the who's who in Legal 100, I'm told, a, a number of times. And you've spoken on many interesting topics over the years. Um, I picked up things like turning your business into a hedge fund and starting and seeding a fund, which I know are topics that many managers or wannabe managers are interested in. Why don't you, in your own words, though, put some color on, on your path in, in this industry? Thank you, Neil. So I got started in the CTA space when I graduated from law school in 1990. And among the first projects I worked on were setting up a number of offshore funds in the Cayman Islands for a firm that many old-timers will know as Refco. And at that time, until about 2014, because most hedge funds were exempt from CFTC regulation, we were very focused on developing a CFTC practice representing many of the world's largest CTAs and CPOs. And I've been at Aiken Gump for about 11 years now, and I head the global commodities trading practice here, where our clients include many systematic CTAs, global macro funds, systematic macro funds, and also systematic hedge funds. Sure. Fantastic. Great. Well, as you can hear, it is clearly a, an A-team we have you know, assembled here today. Now... Our conversation will focus on how the managed futures industry is organized, uh, who are the players, what role do they play, how regulators keep an eye on all these players to check that they play fairly, so to speak. So I'm going to start or stay with you, actually, JP, for a little bit longer and ask you to talk about kind of the basic structure of our industry and, and the roles that each of these players have within it. Okay, let's just talk about the um, the regulatory landscape for a second. So in the United States, at the federal level, there is the United States Commodities Futures Trading Commission, which is the federal regulator of commodity futures and many swaps markets. Over the years, they have outsourced or delegated a number of their primary functions to the National Futures Association, of which Jennifer is a representative, which is a self-regulatory organization. So the National Futures Association has historically processed registration of individuals, proficiency testing, review of disclosure documents, more recently reviews of periodic quarterly and you know, reports for CPOs and CTAs. So that's sort of the, the U.S. landscape in terms of regulators. The U.S. landscape in terms of market participants, we primarily focus on representation of commodity pool operators and commodity trading advisors. And unless a firm is engaged in a de minimis amount of futures trading, if it is located in the United States and has one investor and does a you know trading in futures in a pooled vehicle, the firm needs to be registered as a commodity pool operator absent you know, some exemptions for firms that operate very small pools or don't have more than a, you know, a very limited amount of dollars under management. On the managed account side, most firms are registered with the CFTC and members of the NFA as commodity trading advisors. So the distinction between a commodity pool operator is somebody who operates a fund versus a commodity trading advisor that has managed accounts. And most firms are probably um, registered in both capacities. Sure, sure. Now you kind of jumped a little bit into my next question, which was really more on the on the regulatory side. But Jennifer, I'm going to try and pick up a little bit from where JPP left, because from the outside, when you look at it, of course, the US has a number of different regulators: the SEC, the CFTC, the NFA, to to name a few. And it can maybe be a little bit confusing to some. Why do we need 
so many, so to speak, and how do you feel that they are different? And perhaps also, how do you coordinate, if at all, any efforts between the three of them? So for the two government regulators in this area, which is this the SEC that handles the securities and the Commodity Futures Trading Commission that handles commodities, it's really separated by the products. And although there is a lot of overlap in terms of firms, lots of firms trade both securities and futures, one government agency regulates one area and one government agency regulates the other. As you can expect, that's just due to the fact that there's a lot of different constituencies that deal with Congress and they've decided to keep it separate. I know that the CFTC and the SEC try and have some coordination and there's been different harmonization things going along going on over the years and there are certain things that if um, you have certain requirements on the SEC side then maybe you don't have to have those on the CFTC side so there is a little bit of of trying to coordinate between those two agencies but by and large they're they're very separate the difference between the CFTC and NFA is that as JP was stating the CFTC is the government agency NFA is the self-regulatory organization for CPOs and CTAs. And the main difference between the two is that we're the ones that really have the mainline oversight for CPOs and CTAs, whereas the CFTC has more of a a hands-off oversight. They tend to oversee us as we regulate the CPOs and CTAs, but they don't do, for example, they don't do a lot of um, examinations themselves of those firms. They rely on NFA to do those exams. Sure. Sure, sure. Yeah, I would just say, Jennifer, that the um, CFTC, by and large, is now primarily focused on rulemaking and major enforcement actions. I think that's a great point, yes. I mean, it's interesting to hear about sort of the history of these agencies uh, as well, because I, I clearly remember when I started out in the managed futures industry that The general impression by people when you mentioned the word hedge fund was that these were, you know, investment funds that had absolutely no regulation and could do whatever they wanted. So I do think it's important to distinguish between, you know, the CTA side of the alternative investment industry and the old hedge fund side, so to speak, at least from a historical perspective when it comes to to regulation. Is that something maybe one of you can talk a little bit about how how that is different and how maybe since we are talking about managed futures today, how that really has been regulated for quite a, you know, for, for many decades by, by now. I think from our perspective, we have always um, looked at our regulation responsibilities just in terms of the futures area, unless there's a pool that has been identified with us that trades other products. So we will look at other products that are included in a listed pool but firms are not required to list pools with us that don't trade just al- you know that, that trade only alternative products that don't trade uh, futures. They right. if they choose to list those with us, then then we're required to look at to uh, look at everything in there. So there are a number sure. of pools that are listed with us that don't trade futures at all, um, but for whatever reason they decide to include those um, under our jurisdiction. Yeah. Yeah. Did you want to add something, JP? I was going to say that in the U.S., really, hedge funds were highly unregulated until about 2004 when the SEC decided to impose a rule requiring hedge fund managers to register by looking through funds to count individual investors as clients. And that rule was subsequently overturned by the United States Supreme Court, and along came Dodd-Frank which basically required all all hedge fund managers to either register with the SEC or the state level if they were smaller. And right around the same time, at the end of 2012, the CFTC, not as a result of Dodd-Frank, but as a result of feeling um, the need, I think, to regulate more people, um, also repealed the sort of the big boy exemption from CFTC registration that most hedge funds relied upon, where if you your fund had all qualified purchasers as investors, you could be exempt from CFTC registration, notwithstanding that you might be engaged in 100% futures and derivatives trading. But the CFTC undid that um, exemption, and as a result, thousands of new firms registered and joined the NFA, right, Jennifer? That's correct. We had... I think 10,000 or 12,000, something like that, new pools come in and uh, about 1,800 new firms, I think. Okay. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, the good news is, I guess, that nowadays, any anyone, whether they call themselves a hedge fund or CTA, I mean, it's all regulated now, and I think that investors, you know, can take a lot of comfort in 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 knowing that. Now, now that we've heard a little bit about the sort of the overall structure of the industry today, perhaps you, Art, can give us kind of a historical perspective as to how the industry has evolved in the last 40 plus years that you've been actively involved and get your perspective as to whether this evolution has been beneficial for the industry and the investors around the world who at the end of the day trust their money to CTAs and other service providers uh, in this space. Well, as I mentioned, I started in the mid 70s and at that time there was no CFTC, no NFA. And in fact, the uh, what regulation there was came from the agricultural department. Since they had ex- experience with the, uh, the grains, they were the natural party to, to look over. At that time, there was no financial instruments traded. There was a much, much smaller market. In 1979, the CFTC was formed. It, it took them about a year to kind of figure out what they were doing and how and what. Uh, and in fact, I and a few others worked with them to try to develop the initial regulations. Until the NFA came along, and for a few years after that, the regulation from the CFTC was narrow in scope, but dealt with a lot of minutiae. They were very, very focused on uh, looking at records very deeply and prescribing reporting methods, compliance methods, and that sort of thing. They later, as Jennifer mentioned, delegated much of that to the NFA, I would say. You might say that any of the compliance work, the nitty-gritty, the financial reporting, uh, the investor information that was put out, the market materials, uh, was all delegated to the NFA uh, with the oversight of the CFTC. We also saw at this time that the regulations uh, continued to exempt the large players, certain other players, setting rules for Uh, very small groups, how they had to regulate, if they had to regulate. Gradually, that has changed, whereby today the rules are much broader, capture far more, but they are far less prescriptive and more likely based on general objectives and themes rather than dictating and micromanaging exactly how things occur. This uh, regulation now is much more acceptable to the industry. They are able to work with it more easily. They're able to get help from the NFA. The NFA has a history of being very proactive with managers, helping them things, particularly with marketing materials, which has often been the problem area. You can submit materials in advance to the NFA for review and acceptance. Uh, It's not an endorsement. It's just saying that, yes, it's, it's in compliance or recommending Uh, some changes, areas where maybe it's a little bit too aggressive in the marketing. And that's been quite successful and generally welcomed by the industry as an opportunity, especially for new traders, people coming into the industry that really, the, the regulations are difficult to understand if you don't have perspective and experience. So the NFA has been very helpful in that regard. I think today things run quite smoothly. There are still you know, the occasional bad apple uh, and the NFA and the CFTC together are quite good at ferreting them out. There's much more reporting. Reporting is electronic now rather than paper. And therefore, the NFA can sort through it and the CFTC. But most of that reporting goes to the NFA and they can sort through that very efficiently, identify things that are a little bit askew and investigate further. Sure, sure, sure. Now, and, and thanks very much for that. I, I was actually trying also to get sort of a broader picture of, of the industry as a whole. Uh, you obviously focused uh, uh, very much on the on the regulatory side. So if I can ask you, JP, maybe to talk a little bit about, just, just because we have a very broad audience uh, listening to our conversation, maybe to introduce a little bit of the sort of the different actors that we have in the managed futures industry as a whole, not necessarily just focusing on on the regulatory side. And I mean, you know, the different kind of managers and, and, and so on and so forth, just to give a little bit of a broader perspective before we, we dive into some of the more nitty gritty stuff that, that I want to, to talk to you about today. 
Sure. Um, thank you. Um, so I think, you know, we've talked a little bit about the difference between a CTA and a CPO. The other categories of firms out there that are very relevant are both introducing brokers and futures commission merchants. Futures commission merchants are, in essence, clearing brokers for futures and increasingly certain swaps and other derivatives. And they have custody of customer funds and positions. An introducing broker has neither custody of customer funds nor positions, but oftentimes is useful in routing orders or executing trades and oftentimes provide capital introduction services to their clients for um, CTAs to manage accounts for. Both firms are subject to financial requirements um, with you know, futures commission merchants being subject to much greater levels of capitalization. Introducing brokers can either be guaranteed by a futures commission merchant or be independent, in which case they do have some capital requirements. And I think in, you know, the those are kind of the, t- the four main categories of registrants. There's also something known as a leverage transaction merchant, which I haven't seen one since 1979. Maybe Art has more information on them. And that's all. Those are all very distinct players in the future space, as opposed to you know a broker dealer, which is a you know SEC registered firm and a member of Finra, which executes and clears securities transactions. Sure, sure, sure. No, I think that's that's very uh, that's very helpful. And now, before we move on, I thought it actually could be interesting. We're, we're talking about the managed futures industry that we, you know, have all been involved in for 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 a number of decades. But maybe since you're not coming from the manager side, none of you, and and therefore you you might look at things a little bit differently. Maybe we could talk a little bit about why people should even consider making an investment in the managed futures industry or with a CTA and. Of course, there are different types of CTAs, etc. So we can make it broad. We can make it very specific. That's uh, that's perfectly fine. But from from your perspective, when sort of just just having the 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 argument from a non manager point of view, why should people even consider this? Maybe Art, I can turn to you first on this one. Okay, fine. Well, certainly any large portfolio, and I would only suggest managed futures for a larger portfolio. Uh, because you, you don't want to put all your money into futures, and I don't think there's any CTA or CPO out there that advocates that. So putting a percentage in managed future gets you diversification that is generally uncorrelated, not negatively correlated necessarily, but uncorrelated with other investment opportunities, particularly equities. So that's one reason to do it is the diversification. Uh, sec- secondly, you, you get what might be called free leverage. And by that, I mean you only have to put up margin deposit on a contract that has a huge amount of value. So rather than having to put up all the money to buy 5,000 bushels of grain, you can buy a futures contract on 5,000 bushels and putting up a small deposit on that. That deposit money would have to be increased if the value of the contract decreased and vice versa, you can actually take out money if the value of the contract increases. Uh, you have to still have to maintain a margin requirement. Margin requirements can change during the life of a contract, so you don't know for certain how much you have to put in. So those are two reasons uh, to put in it. You get a different perspective from the standpoint of the manager, so you get that in it as opposed to what you would get in equities, whereas in equities there's a, a general common denominator there are a lot of variations but generally you're getting one theme from investment managers of equities uh, and bonds that you're not getting in futures so those are three reasons uh, that you might uh, invest in futures sure 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 jp jennifer do you have any any other thoughts on this or i think art summed it up quite nicely yeah, I, I would say in addition to um, the, the very artful summary that Art presented, is that many larger institutions um, also seek exposure to managed futures for tail protection. So, you know, 2008 was a fabulous year for managed futures, many managed futures managers, whereas it was you know, a terrible year for most other asset classes. So, 
many larger institutions maintain an allocation to manage futures in case you know there's another black swan event so that they at least have a hedge to their overall portfolio. Now, in my preparations for our conversation today, I was kind of wondering if we could approach this a little bit like a case study to to showcase what it takes to set up a CTA business today, really from a product slash accounting point of view and what do you need to structure and how do you structure your offering, so to speak, what regulation is required and not least what you're allowed to do in order to attract new investors to your fund, which we may also touch upon a little bit later. And since we have a global audience, perhaps we can also talk a little bit about what the steps are if you're, say, a firm based in in Europe that wants to raise assets in, in the U.S. Now, JP, since you've given a talk about something like how to organize your business for success, I thought maybe why don't you take the lead on this kind of small managed futures crash course. I mean, what's the evolution for someone who wants to start out as a, as a manager in this business? What do they, what docs do they need to line up, so to speak? Okay. So the first, the first thing to, um, you know, point out, I think is that, which we did that you know, registration with the CFTC and membership in the NFA is a, a fairly low barrier to entry, um, as opposed to, you know, firms located in Europe who may have to register as alternative investment fund managers um, the, the single biggest gating issue is that at least one person has to take and pass the Series 3 examination. Over the years, I, you know, I've met thousands of individuals who have taken the Series 3 examination and only met one who didn't pass it the first time. So it's not a particularly difficult examination, but it does require some preparation. There is also a fingerprinting and background check requirement, which you know has gotten very easy over the years. For managers located outside the United States, depending on where they're located, um, you know, fingerprinting is very easy in London and in Switzerland. And if you're located in India, it may be a little more difficult. But so, you know, firms can expect that it will take between, you know, two to six or eight weeks to become, you know, registered and a member of the NFA, at which case they are can be up and running in order to have a hedge fund or commodity pool. If a firm is targeting more retail type investors, they would need to submit the fund offering document for review and comment by the NFA. Uh, Most of our clients rely on an exemption known as CFTC Rule 4.7, whereby if they limit their investor types to certain qualified investors, which are basically individuals who have an investment portfolio of $2 million or more, or certain you know professional investors um, or non-US people, then you can bypass having to file the disclosure document or offering document with the NFA. And there the manager just remains subject to general anti-fraud provisions that they can't not you know, have misleading information or omit to state misleading material information in the offering document. So that you know takes a little bit of doing to get the offering document done. And that can be done concurrently while the firm is pending registration. Once a fund is up and running, then, you know, if you are accepting investors in the United States, all of a sudden what you're doing is you are selling securities and there are some aspects of SEC compliance that one needs to deal with, including claiming an exemption from the registration of the interests in the funds under the U.S. Securities Act of 1933, which typically entails filing a Form D with the SEC and making similar filings or relying on exemptions for offers and sales under state securities or blue sky laws. On the managed account side, there is a very similar regime that once a firm is registered, it can file a 4.7 election and not have to submit its commodity trading advisor disclosure document with the NFA provided that its customers are also these sophisticated investors known as qualified eligible persons. Sure, 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 sure. That's great. Now, Art, you know, We've heard of some of the preparations, but there's also certain documents that, that needs to be prepared. And, and I wonder whether that's also something that you, uh, on your side, help out with before they are, f- are fully ready. How do you see the initial phase, if, if there's anything to add to what uh, JP was talking about? Right. I, I will uh, take that question and, and expand it just a bit. Yeah. I agree with JP that entry is easy, but success is very difficult. Right. Uh, anyone that looks to get into it has to understand what their edge is. Why are you different? What do you have 
that is going to be able to attract investors. If, for example, you have a trend following system, you're going to be like a thousand other traders out there, and you're not going to have much success raising money unless you can define some reason why you are better, different, or significant, or have history, have experience. You've got to have something along those lines, or you will not succeed. It is also essential to have counsel and accountants that are experienced in this industry. If your lawyer is also your barber, you are in the wrong place and you're going to have trouble. I know that these professionals are expensive, but you have to have a budget adequate to get the help that you need or you will make mistakes or have errors that can have a very long-term impact on you. If you end up with an NFA or possibly CFTC action against you for some possibly even innocent innocent mistake, but nonetheless some error or you make some trade error because you haven't had the right advice, it is almost impossible to overcome that for somebody starting out. Also starting out, you're going to have to have real money, whether it's your own money that you may have accumulated or money from family and friends. You have to have a trading history or you're just not going to get many people or any people to invest with you. Hypothetical trading just doesn't do it. Pro formas just doesn't do it. People believe, as I do, I've been in this industry 40 years. I've never seen a bad hypothetical. That certainly doesn't do much for their credibility. Yeah. No, thanks for expanding on that for sure. Very important points. Now, Jennifer, be before you know, a firm is even allowed to make use of all this preparation, which I'm sure will take you know a little bit of time and cost a little bit of money, as as we've heard, the regulator comes into the picture. Tell me a little bit about sort of the initial interaction and and how the new actors in this industry usually starts the dialogue with you as a regulator and also how that dialogue evolves over time as the firm gets up and running. Sure. So as uh, JP was mentioning, the first interaction that a firm is going to have with NFA is during the registration process. They're filing their applications with us. They're showing us there that they've passed a series three exam. They're listing out all of the principles, which would be any um, officers of the firm, any owners of the firm that own 10% or more, anyone who has a controlling influence. So they would have to get background checks on all of those people through the fingerprint process. Um, they'd have to register any brokers with us. Those are the people that would um, that solicit accounts and handle the orders on behalf of the firm. So those are the people that would need the Series 3 exam. So we're involved in that whole process we're reviewing the results of the fingerprint uh, checks. And so if there is anything that comes back that shows that there could possibly be a statutory disqualification for an individual, we will go through that information and determine whether or not that person should be registered. And if we do allow them to be registered, whether or not there could be conditions on that registration. So for example, somebody might be able to come in, but they might not be allowed to supervise other brokers, for example. JP also talked a little bit about the disclosure document process. That's another part that we get involved in very early on in the firm's membership process. We do have a team in the compliance department that reviews all the disclosure documents that are submitted and looks to make sure that they are complete and in accordance with the CFTC regulations. We don't verify the accuracy of a lot of the information in those documents, we do to some extent. So if, for example, it lists out background information that shows that the person was registered at, at other firms previously, we'll compare that to the information we have and make sure that that's accurate. But if, for example, they list performance in there, we're not going to, at that point, request support for that performance. We're going to calculate it and make sure that it is calculated correctly, but we're not going to necessarily ask for the support. The other things I think that firms need to be aware of as they're getting off the ground, and, and I completely agree with Art that having you know, qualified consultants and accountants and attorneys helping you with this process really goes a long way, is just the, the amount of procedures and programs that you need to have in place to make sure that you can effectively run your operations. Mm. There are, there's, for example, each firm is required to have a cybersecurity program. You know, a lot of firms that we deal with say, oh, you know, I don't have, like, I don't have my own platform that I use, or I don't have, you know, uh, I don't handle customer funds or, you know, things along those lines. So 
We have an interpretive notice that deals with the cybersecurity program and helps give guidance to firms and allows for some flexibility based on their operations. But there are certain requirements that need to be at least addressed in those programs. And it's important for firms to really have a good understanding of what is required in that area. A disaster recovery program is another area that we require. Um, So it's just important for firms to realize that there are a lot of things Um, that are, that need to be in place as they're getting off the ground. I think one thing that's very helpful to firms as they're newly registered with NFA is we have a document that we offer called the self-examination checklist, and that's available on our website. And it really goes through all the different areas of a firm's operations. It breaks it up by uh, registration category. So separate documents for FCMs, IBs, CPOs, and CTAs. And kind of goes through step by step in the different areas, what information is required or to make sure that your procedures, for example, include certain certain pieces. And we really encourage firms to go through that at the beginning of their operations to make sure that they've identified all of the areas that need to be identified. Sure, sure, sure. And once they're sort of up and running and they pass sort of the first hurdle, what's, what's the ongoing dialogue like with the NFA? So I think the biggest thing that firms get concerned about is when are we going to come and actually do an examination of the firm? We do about 600 examinations a year and we have about 3,600 members. So as you can imagine, not every firm is going to be examined every year. Some will, depending on the type of business that they do or the risks involved, but some, it may be several years in between exams. And we don't really have a set time period that we requ- that we're required to do most firms, but we have a pretty robust risk system that we use in conjunction with just you know humans looking at information and saying, "Oh, you know, there's here's a problem here. Let's go take a look and do an examination." Um, but we will yeah. identify all of the firms that we feel we need to go in and examine during that year. Most of the exams that we do are announced, so we will contact you ahead of time. Usually it's it's between two and four weeks ahead of time and let you know when we're planning on coming, give you a list of documents that we would be looking at, and really try and and make sure that you're aware of, of what kinds of things we're going to be looking at during the course of our testing. Very rarely will we just show up at your door, uh, you know, one day and say, hi, we're here to conduct an exam. Yeah. Yeah, no, that that's that's great. Now, I want to move on to other topics, but I also want to stay on this just a little bit longer because I think it is interesting. I want to hear your perspective a little bit about whether, you know, JP started out by saying the barrier to entry is very low, but, you know, I'll add it to that, but the success is, is, you know, it's very hard to stay there. And I think when I hear you talk about, you know, what is required, it certainly isn't it, it's not that easy and 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 you need as, as art was saying you need real money to pay good good advices in the beginning so to, just out of curiosity a little bit and and maybe comparing to your experience you know 10 15 20 years ago I mean is there a risk in the way things have evolved that we might lose some emerging talent that just simply can't come up with that kind of money to to get started because it is an entrepreneurial industry I mean if you go back and you Look at the people who are very successful today. I mean, they didn't start out with all these things in place necessarily. So I'm just, I just want to raise the question and 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 see what you think about it. Yeah, I would, I would, just one thing that that I would think is that I know Art had talked a little bit earlier about having a, a track record, and I think one thing that we see firms stumble with is that they get registered before they have any type of track record and then start trading just proprietary funds and realize maybe that they're, they might not be as successful as they hoped they would be. Right. And so I, w- sure. I would suggest that if there are any firms out there to really try and build your own personal track record with your own funds. And if you're successful, then at that point, you start thinking about registering as opposed to registering and having to worry about all these requirements as you're also trying to build a track record. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point, Jennifer. Thanks for that. Yeah, I agree with that as well, because having some trading experience before you register will identify, you know, if you have ability, if you know what you're doing, if you do have some stumbles while you're trading proprietary trading and maybe just getting an understanding, you don't necessarily have to disclose what your proprietary trading is. Yeah, 
Yeah. Now, before we move on, maybe we could change gear a little bit for a moment. We've been talking a lot about what it takes to start up as a manager in this industry, but how about looking at all of this from the investor's point of view? I mean, what what should investors be looking for when they start their due diligence process? I mean, what are the questions they should be asking that may not be in the standard DDQ templates that most people seem to be using? I don't know who wants to to start out on this, but I think that's also very very relevant in this context. I'll jump in here. Uh, I tell folks that are just starting out that they have to get very serious about infrastructure and investors who are looking to invest with managers, especially new managers. You need to look at the infrastructure, see what plans they have in place, who the personnel are, what their background is, are they likely to succeed, what, what happens if the principal is unavailable, what happens if they are ill or on vacation, who are their lawyers, who are their accountants. In other words, you want to look at all the things that say, yes, this is a good business, whether they're making widgets or trading futures. Is it a business that has a plan, that has the proper people doing the right things, the right professional advisors? All of that infrastructure is critical in an assessment of whether or not they are likely to succeed apart from their, their trading ability. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. JP, what what uh, what do you see on on this? Well, I think you know many investors um, do due diligence, and all the points Art has mentioned are you know I'm absolutely in agreement with. I think people should also, as investors, spend some time actually reviewing fund terms and you know, legal documentation to understand you know what what terms they are getting, and you know. Rather than you know, just sign a subscription agreement saying that they've read the documents, they should read the fund offering documents from cover to cover and also the partnership agreements. Make sure that the fund documents accurately reflect what the rights and obligations of the investors are. And you know, I think that gets to Art's point that you know, a fund which has you know, recognized service providers, you're not going to have any hidden surprises where the documents don't match. I think you know many investors also look at you know the registration of the manager. They can check you know with the NFA to make sure the manager is registered. If the investor is itself a collective investment vehicle, it would have obligations under NFA Bylaw 1101 to make sure that the fund that it's investing in is either appropriately registered with the CFTC and a member of the NFA, or exempt from such registration. So those are just kind of practical things that managers and, it, and typically, if you know they are looking at track records, you should make sure that you're looking at an apples to apples comparison. That's why even many managers that are you know 4.7 exempt and Art will chime in on this, but it used to be that all managers were particularly CTAs and also CPOs had to prepare 13 column performance tables, so they would you know their performance would be very comparable. Now the NFA, you know, has allowed for more flexibility in performance reporting, including presentation based on nominal account size. But I still think when you're looking at two track records, you should be able to get comfortable that both managers are reporting their performance in pretty much the same manner. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.